welcome into the Bubba Rose Show, episode seven, a bonus podcast, uh, an episode that I'm calling the Knights Roundtable. And we're taking a look at everything that's transpired with UCF over the last month plus, a lot going on down in Orlando. And uh, before we dive into everything, welcome in um, Jason Beatty from Knights 24-7, UCF's 24-7 sports site. Also Jeff Allen from the Nightline Sports Network and Jeff Allen Sports Talk. Jeff Sharon uh, from UCF's SB Nation source, and that's the Black and Gold Banneret. And then uh, last but certainly not least, Trace Trilco from the Sons of UCF podcast. Gentlemen, how are you? Good. All good. Good, Bubba. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Yes, Appreci appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, working around my crazy schedule, having, having two uh, young kids and having to reschedule from the end of last week, but uh, better late than never. Um, but so let's just dive right into it. Let's go back to mid-January, a little over a month ago now, when the dominoes started to fall. Of course, in middle, the middle of January, you're typically uh, pretty settled on the coaching front, but the dominoes fell up in Knoxville uh, with everything that was going on with Jeremy Pruitt and the Vols football program. Then Philip Fulmer retired as well. And then um, that's when the dominoes fell down to Orlando. So, um, Let's just start off with Jeff Allen. Uh, what was your take on everything back there in uh, mid-January when Dr. Danny White was hired away by the University of Tennessee? Well, the first words that came out of my mouth were, oh, no, <laughs> because uh, certainly we expected that uh, Danny White had a future beyond UCF. We were just hoping it wasn't going to be this soon. So uh, that was my first reaction uh, when that particularly happened. And then Actually, I texted a friend, which I might be rolling a little bit ahead first, but I texted a buddy of mine says, so who does he call first, Frost or Heupel? So uh, that was kind of my, my first takes uh, with that. And then obviously, you know, uh, just knowing what Danny White has done for UCF and uh, it elevated the athletics department, not just in football, where, of course, that has certainly raised the brand name beyond heights that we'd ever seen before. But, uh, but basketball, soccer, baseball, all the sports, volleyball have all seen great upticks uh, under, under Danny White's leadership and the fundraising and everything that goes along with it. Uh, you know, he's a hard guy to replace, which, uh, you know, we'll obviously talk about that a little bit as well. Yeah, before we move on and get your thoughts, Trace, um, you, know, you talked about Danny White uh, preparing for this interview. Obviously, I knew he was a tremendous AD, but Stadium had ranked him the fourth best AD in the country, uh, known for being very innovative and a strong track record at Buffalo prior to going to UCF. Um, the hires that he made there, uh, one that really comes to mind is obviously Bobby Hurley, who moved on after a tremendous stint at Buffalo to uh, – ASU and taking that job out in Tempe. But um, what, what were your thoughts, Trace, as things were starting to, uh, the snowballs were starting to roll back in mid-January? I think the main thought that I had is that it just seemed to be several weeks of difficult news for the UCF fan base, from Mackenzie Milton announcing he was going to Florida State, uh, the bowl loss, uh, the uh, death of longtime UCF football coach Gene McDowell. It was just a series of things that really, for the first time since the 2015 season, had me and, and UCF's Night Nation feeling like they were on their heels a bit, uh, that the momentum was gone. And uh, so losing Danny White, not that, as Jeff said, it was unexpected at some point, but just the timing of it, of course, no good time for such news. And, and then you left to wonder, what does it mean? who comes in next, and then, you know, a week later, as, as we'll get to in this storyline, the head coach uh, leaves as well. So just a great period of uncertainty for Night Nation. You brought up an excellent point. You talked about the, the expedited um, process and just how quickly the timeline uh, moved. And that was on January 18th. The Tennessee parted ways with Jeremy Pruitt. Then um, on January 21st, Dr. Danny White was hired. Then – January 27th, Josh Heupel was hired. Uh, when, when I saw Dr. Danny White um, being hired um, just from afar, I thought, well, it's not going to surprise me at all if Josh Heupel's um, the decision for Dr. Danny White, and that obviously ended up being the case. Um, Jason, you're obviously very close to the UCF program. Um, was it a surprise to you? I think it was a surprise personally for me that Danny White hired Josh Heupel. Um, my mom asked me immediately and, and I tell her things and uh, we talk about UCF every so often. She's more of an outsider perspective for sure. 
But I remember she asked me, like, what are my thoughts? And I, and this is like right after I told her that Josh was headed to Tennessee. And I said, I'm not surprised that Josh Heifel took the job. I'm more surprised that Danny White offered him the job. And, and that's not to say Josh isn't a good coach and not a great offensive mind. And I'm sure he'll have some success and put up a lot of points at Tennessee and uh, really, you know, transform the program uh, from what we've seen the past few years out of them. But overall, I was just, you know, I don't want to say Danny White struck out because I wasn't following the coaching search up until Josh's name started swirling around. Um, but I, if you had to be honest, I don't think Josh Heupel was his first option. But I just want to say real quick, it's, it's, it's from everything that has transpired since then, it's incredible how long ago that feels. I mean, just from the AD search for UCF and then the head coach search for football, uh, that, that feels, it does not feel like a month ago. I mean, it really doesn't. It feels a lot longer just with so much the, you know, you talk about perspective and, and how Trace mentioned it did feel for a long time. There were just, you know, punch after punch after punch. And then, you know, you look at what's transpired over this past month. It's, it's pretty remarkable how things change so quickly. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Um, and you bring up an excellent point as far as as far as Coach Heupel. And one of the things that really stood out to me and or thoughts that came to mind, rather, um, obviously he'd had a tremendous amount of success in Orlando. And we'll dive into that a little bit more um, as far as maybe the way things were trending. Um, I know a lot of frustration was shown, uh, at least it was – a certain faction of the UCF fan base, as I'll get to in a minute, but um, Tennessee over the last several years, and they had had an opportunity to, to hire Greg Schiano. Obviously, there were some things there in Coach Schiano's past that Tennessee fans, uh, at least they used that as the reason. Uh, I don't know whether that was legitimately the reason or not. I, I have my doubts, but he had um, proven himself up at Rutgers, um, but they didn't want to hire him. And um, some of the East Carolina friends of mine and some others, um, we really thought that they should have gone in that direction back then. But uh, getting back to the, the present, uh, Jeff Sharon, what were your thoughts on, with Coach Heupel? And uh, were, were you surprised that Danny White gave him the call? I, I was, I'm, I'm with Jason. I, I was really surprised that, that Danny White went as quickly with Josh Heupel as he did. Now, I had no information I don't know about the rest of you guys, but we had no information that whether or not Danny White had asked anyone else. I think that we had speculated over on our side that he might go after Lance Leipold at Buffalo, who he had a prior relationship with and actually hired at the University of Buffalo. Um, so we were surprised because the trajectory, as, as many games as Josh Heupel won, and I don't know if this is entirely fair to him, but the trajectory was down from his first season, from one loss in the season ending bowl game to three losses and not getting to the conference championship game to a six and four season. Granted, there were a lot of other factors associated with that, but um, I was, I was surprised that it actually went down pretty quickly and actually pretty quietly. Um, I know, like you said, there were plenty of UCF fans who were, you know, not uh, who, who weren't all that sad to see Josh go. Um, whereas, you know, in the intervening week when Danny white left, it felt like the sky was falling over here. And, um, I think that the one guy who actually deserves a lot, a lot of credit is the new president at UCF, Alexander Cartwright. Uh, Dr. Cartwright is, uh, he, he was brought on, or he was officially confirmed as the president in March of 2020, following John Hitt, who had been the president from uh, 1992 through to 2018, and then Dale Whitaker, who exited uh, under inauspicious circumstances um, due to a uh, due to a funding scandal, but you know, Whitaker never had the chance to actually hire an athletic director. And when Hit got here, of course, the late Gene McDowell was the athletic director at UCF, and they went through, a no and he went through a number of different hires of who he wanted in charge of his athletic department. But uh, as far as President Cartwright was concerned, this was his first time hiring an AD, and I think that at least for the moment, UCF fans have, you know, have, have pretty much reached the consensus that he's knocked it out of the park with Terry Mohajer coming over from Arkansas State. He needed to make a big hire, President Cartwright did, and he came through. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so we'll go ahead, we'll, we'll transition um, here in just a moment to, to the present and, and talked about and those tremendous hires with Terry Mahajer and then also Gus Malzahn there uh, a couple weeks or so later. But just talk about um, 
with, with Josh Heupel. Um, before we move on, uh, the rest of you guys, Jeff's kind of already expressed his thoughts there. But how large a percentage of the UCF fan base do you think was growing fairly frustrated with um, with the way things seem to be trending? Oh boy! Uh, you and, know. and I know that uh, that's that's a very tough question to answer and, and it's more just kind of what what you sense because that's something that obviously you guys haven't polled thousands upon thousands <laughs> of people but just what what's your gut feel you know if you go by twitter it's you know it's probably much higher than than actual reality but i would say you know you're probably looking at at least 50 50 if not 60 40 okay um you know i i, f- I find it very interesting that um you know, I thought I thought coming into the season, if Josh Heifel was still going to be the UCF head coach, this was going to be sort of a watershed year for him. Uh, as you mentioned, the, the trending of his record. And, uh, you know, I was of the opinion that uh, that he needed to make some changes, not just like with his defensive coordinator, but with his own philosophy to some degree, because um, while the UCF fast is a, a great thing, they would go fast from the 20 to the 20 and in the red zone you know, they, they, they would be almost in a sales pace. And it, it just seemed like there was a lot of inconsistency with that. The other piece of that with, uh, with Hypo, I also thought, felt like he probably should have started to see his play calling and start spending more time as the head coach, because I think the play calling was starting to uh, become uh, easily too predictable. And um, again, I think, I think this was going to be an interesting year for him as far as uh, as far as uh, his future in Orlando would have been concerned but you know he gets the uh, he gets the lifeline uh, and he gets to go to Knoxville now if he thinks you know UCF's fan base is uh, is critical you know I spent time in Knoxville back in the Peyton Manning days and that was a very boisterous and opinionated if not sometimes delusional kind of like now uh, uh, fan base there is if uh, and that was before social media so if Josh Heupel thinks the UCF fan base was critical, he's about to see a whole nother dose of that. And you brought up an excellent point, Jeff, as far as the Twitter verse and the message boards, and you, you, you um, did your best to answer that question. Uh, maybe it wasn't well worded on my part, but just um, basically what I was looking for is whether it was a loud um, minority or not. And, and so, so you, you seem to think it was certainly more than a loud minority. Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I'm thinking 50-50. But, um, you know, moving on, taking a look, um, like I mentioned, Hypo was hired away on January 27th is when he was announced at Tennessee. And there, oh, just shy of two weeks later is when UCF announced Terry Mahajer coming over from Arkansas State. Um, he was someone – I was familiar with Arkansas State's situation in terms of everything they had gone through prior to Blake Anderson with their football coaches uh, going through one per season. And then, obviously, Gus Malzahn had not been hired um, by Mahajer. But then uh, there he is at his alma mater. Um, uh, he obviously did the, did the wise thing after everything they had been through, uh, upping the buyouts. Uh, each and every coach that he hired there, hired Brian Harson, hired Blake Anderson, and most recently Butch Jones. So what was your initial take um, with Mahajer? And we'll start with you, Jeff Sharon. You've already touched on it a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I was, as we were following that search through the weekend, there were several big names who were, who were being um, bandied about. And, but, but Terry Mahajer's name was kept very quiet. And we heard... As I'm sure, as I'm sure the other guys have, that there was this a a, a a double secret probation candidate that was that that had reportedly knocked his interview out of the park, and when it came out that uh, and, I, and I think it was Jason who um, who who was on this uh, when it came out that it was Terry Mohajer from Arkansas State. Honestly, we were pretty surprised about how how it would about how that would be because. Like you mentioned, Terry is an alumnus of Arkansas State, um, had done a remarkable job there of building this prog- of building that program to be a real power in the Sun Belt, not just in football, but in terms of all sports, really. Um, and so to, for him to uh, come on board to UCF, leaving his alma mater after, after a good eight, nine years that he was there, um, 
you know, and, and all the success that he had, you know, it's, it's, I still find it quite surprising because, you know, that's kind of like a dream job for a guy like him, but it also shows the, the power of the brand of UCF right now, where, you know, a guy like Terry Mohajer would leave his alma mater for a place like UCF. His success speaks for itself, at least there. And now he's ready for an, and now, and he obviously felt that he was ready for a new challenge um, at a school like UCF. And that's one of the things that stood out to me. Um, it wasn't surprising to hear him say, and Gus Malzahn said something similar as well. And we'll get to that in a few minutes, but, um, and that was what you're saying, Jeff, as far as Terry Mahajer and saying it's going to take a special situation, basically to, to I'm paraphrasing here, but to get him away from Jonesboro, Arkansas. So, and so Jason, um, what was your take on um, the hiring of Terry? You know, I think for me, it's, it's, you know, if you want to look at ADs that are very similar to Danny White, very outspoken, that was one thing I knew. You know, you talk about Danny's, one of his biggest moments was claiming a national championship for UCF football 2017. Uh, someone who is, you know, well-respected, but also would also speak his mind and be honest, that's Terry Mahajer. Uh, I think a lot of other national, that was kind of the national reaction as well. Um, you know, I think it's like Jeff mentioned, it was pretty obvious in his intro press conference when he mentioned Arkansas State that he got extremely emotional. And that says so much about the uniqueness of the job at UCF. Um, I think for him, you know, it, it was pretty interesting. You mentioned, Jeff mentioned before, just how secret his name was. There was a 24-hour period where Jim Sterk was the athletic director and people were not happy with that. And, and you know, I don't know if that's credit to Alex Cartwright for letting things get out and then, you know, putting up smoke screens and, and whatever you want to call them. But, um, you know, I, th I think it's for, for someone coming from a program like Arkansas State, people want to focus on the hirings and, and how athletics perform. But I think the biggest thing is his fundraising abilities. That's one thing Danny White did so well. And that's something that Terry Mahajer did so well at Arkansas State that helped transform that program. So, you know, for, for him to come into UCF, I think he's, he's off to a great start and, and we'll see if he'll be able to continue that. Of course, with the contract, you're always going to have different incentives um, included in there. And um, I noticed there were $200,000 worth of incentives. Um, maybe you guys can elaborate more on this in terms of, you know, academic goals, your athletic goals, obviously. And then also you, you just touched on uh, some of the financial goals. So uh, can, can you guys elaborate a little bit on the contract? I, I know um, Terry's contract is 795000 base in year one. Yeah, I think one of the big programs that he had at Arkansas State, I don't remember the exact title of it, but it was like a leadership program. I know Forbes wrote an article about it. Basically, 100% of athletes basically could come back and, and, and they'd end up, whether they were playing pro sports or whatever, but if they weren't, they could get a job. And, and – and a, and a solid job in Jonesboro. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard of any program like that. And he says he wants to uh, launch a similar program at UCF. I mean, you talk about, you know, performance on the, on the, on the field, most, most of the time football or basketball or whatever sport it may be. But I know he had, you know, looking over his biography and what he was able to accomplish at Arkansas state is, you know, we all talk about APR and academic ratings Arkansas State had really high numbers in those in those uh, fields, and I think that's one part of athletics that people don't really focus on. Those aren't the you know the the big shiny objects, academics and 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 job placements and things like that. But it it became pretty clear during his intro press conference that that Terry really cares about these athletes, and he wants not just for them to you know go pro in their sport or or, or win championships for UCF, but you know, make a life and, and get their education and, and, and earn a living, loving what they do and, and, you know, he, you know, have success for the future and have a good foundation. So um, that was one big thing that stood out to me as well. Yeah. Jason, if I can interject, I'm sorry, Bubba, but what that, that program that you're talking about is called the, the Red Wolves Leadership Academy program that he had at a state. And like you said, the goal is a hundred percent placement in either a job or acceptance to graduate school for every student athlete at Arkansas State. And you're right, he did say that he wanted to bring that to UCF. And, and I think what's, what's important to mention about Terry is that 
he has a uh, he he brought with him a lot of connections to Fortune 500 companies. So he was able to back up that program with his own connections within and outside the athletic world. No, Jeff, I, I appreciate you chiming in with that because that was something that I had not come across in terms of something he had implemented at Arkansas State. And um, you had an excellent article on the Black and Gold Bannerette. I don't remember if it was you or maybe one of your other writers, I believe actually um, 10 things to know about Terry Mahajer. And uh, some of those things really jumped out to me, four years of coaching experience with the offensive line and special teams at Kansas back in the mid nineties. And then uh, some of the experiences he had had since then. And he had hired a lot more than just uh, a football coach or excuse me, three football coaches at Arkansas state. He had hired uh, what, two men's basketball coaches, women's basketball, men's golf, volleyball, and women's soccer also. And so, so is that something that kind of jumped off uh, at you, Jeff Allen, or Trace? Go ahead, Trace. I'll jump in. Uh, what strikes me about Terry is that he comes into the job at UCF much more seasoned than Danny White did when he arrived as athletic director. Uh, and so I think that bodes well for UCF, his experience. And I'll tell you what, the, the head football coach and Josh Heupel tethered right to that athletic director and Danny White, and there at least felt like there was a momentum change, right? And it was uh, a decline. And it almost seems as if though, in a very short period of time, as you've outlined earlier, it's a reset button and there's wind in the sails for the program with the energy that Terry brings, uh, the passion that he brings, uh, you know, his connection to uh, social media, he carries that on, uh, a different scheduling philosophy than Danny White. And as Jason mentioned, uh, fundraising being something that's very important to him, tied to facilities improvements. And while UCF has a lot of great facilities, you can also see where there are areas where improvements are needed and upgrades are needed. And as he said in his opening press conference that he ties facilities to fundraising. How can he sell a seat, a locker room? How can he tie those two things together? And I'm not saying that Danny White had lost momentum, but you wonder if a new voice was needed and maybe the age of a, a 25 year athletic director, maybe you need a reset. Uh, and again, if you're hiring the right person, uh, you know, Perhaps Danny White had wrung as much money out of Central Florida as he was capable riding that 2017 and 2018 wave. And now Terry comes in with a new energy and certainly uh, the Gus bus, as I'm sure you'll transition to shortly, also uh, creates that sense of momentum. Ticket sales, fundraising dollars, donations, and just positive press, not only locally, but nationally, all in a very short period of time. So it seems like UCF, and as Jeff mentioned, Dr. Cartwright hit the reset button at a really good time after what had been several weeks of difficult news for uh, the UCF fan base. Yeah, and I like to add too that I really think the 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 energy and enthusiasm that, that Terry Bahadur brings is definitely refreshing. It's a uh, you know it, we've gotten kind of used to uh, under Danny White and Josh Heupel things being very closed and tight lipped, and um, you know government secrets have never been kept better. Than at UCF, now you now, now you have uh, now you have you know some personality and some vibrancy that's uh, that's going to be uh, kind of exciting for us. Yeah, you talk about um, Terry's personality um, kind of shining through. I saw some TikTok videos that maybe you guys had uh, shared. Great... Somebody on social media, um, those those were pretty entertaining with, with with him and his wife and daughters and just cutting up, having a good time. Yeah, those obviously aren't necessities for any AD, right? But it certainly helps, you know, it's like you talk about, you know, Josh Heupel wasn't, you know, I think that was one thing that maybe made it easier for him to see go for UCF fans. He wasn't the most personable, at least publicly. I mean, I, I covered him for multiple years, obviously when he was at UCF, and I could only tell one or two stories where he really just, opened up with the media um and that's that's you know fair fair to him you know whatever his whatever he wants to be behind closed doors that's that's for him but you you see what terry mahajer has done and i i would not i would say danny white was you know he could make some people laugh and had some good lines and things like that especially uh some confrontational stuff but 
Terry and, and, and Gus Malzahn definitely bring some good energy for UCF. Yeah, no doubt about it. And, um, you know, transitioning, talk about that hiring of, of Gus Malzahn. Um, as soon as Terry Mahajo was hired, kind of like with the Heifel situation, I don't know, just connecting the dots and certainly didn't mean that it was going to happen. But uh, I was like, with him being available, I would certainly make Gus Malzahn turn it down. And um, Gus, in his introductory press conference, was talking about um, just how interested he was even prior to um, Terry Mahajra's hiring. And then uh, him getting the job uh, really, you know, sealed the deal as far as him, hey, I got to get this job. So, so that was something um, that was uh, one of the big takeaways, um, like Gus talked about in his um, press conference, just as far as the, the alignment there within the program. So uh, was that something that really jumped out and stood out to you guys as well, as far as far as uh, Gus's passion for for the job and then just the the alignment? Yeah, I I I, I think that it was when you, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Looking back on it, it's like you know Gus Malzahn, of course, would kind of be an obvious hire, given going back to Terry Mahajer's, um experience and working with him at Arkansas State. Granted, Terry didn't hire him uh at arkansas state but they did work together through the 2012 football season the one year when gus was there uh gus was actually hired by terry's predecessor and terry came on in september of 2012 um at arkansas state but um i i, I don't know about you guys but we uh, when the word came down and again credit to jason because he kind of broke this first um that ucf was going to offer gus malzahn for, there was uh you know, overnight and into the morning, I remember that day, there was uh, it, 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 the initial reaction from the fan base, again, you know, vocal minority probably, but was not overly positive. But once the news kind of came through and everyone kind of had a few minutes to kind of step back and think about it for a second, it, it, it the sentiment really turned around and, and, and the fan base is really excited about um, getting uh, Gus Malzahn on board. And Gus himself had said, you know, I in the press conference that, you know, he thought about sitting out of coaching for at least a year, doing some television and, uh, and, and kind of, you know, feeling things out a little bit. But when the UCF job came open, he said that he was interested right away in that. And that was before UCF had even hired Terry Mahajer as, the AD. And then once Terry came in, he was, he became, I guess, super, super interested. <laughs> and, and the negotiations were pretty, must've been pretty easy um, from then on, but it, it certainly seems like uh, on paper, this seems like a great match. Yeah. I tell you what, Jeff, I, I have to say that I was kind of in that lukewarm category when Gus's name came up, you know, because how often have we seen, you know, guys come off uh, from a power five program down to the G5, you know, that doesn't generally work out for long-term or very well, but uh, to you, to your point, uh, you know, he won the press conference. I mean, just immediately kind of took control and, and set forth a great amount of enthusiasm. And then you start to think about what he did at Auburn, you know, and, and what he's done with offenses. And it's like, okay, it doesn't have to be the Josh Heupel offense, but you know, he's got still got a lot of great skill players to play with and, yeah, he's got a quarterback. I mean, that had to be yeah. one of the biggest attractions to him with UCF. It's like, ooh, Dylan Gabriel. That's a, that's a no-brainer, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it feels like uh, I, I saw a couple of people who were saying that Dylan Gabriel might be the best quarterback that Gus Malzahn has ever had in his time as a college as a college head coach. Um, and he had Cam Newton. <laughs> yeah, and he had Cam Newton. Although he was an offensive coordinator when he had Cam, but yes. Uh, but he was, but there was that thought coming down. I think the other thing too, that, that, and I wanted, I'm, I'm interested to know what, what you guys thought was, uh, you know, when we talked to folks at, you know, who were connected with Auburn, they had expressed to us how much they really loved Gus, how much the players really loved Gus, both current and former players and how over the previous two seasons, there was a group of Auburn boosters who were trying to push him out. And you know how it is, and you got, we all know how it is in the SEC. It's so competitive, and there's a lot of meddling with the boosters. And 
Gus finds himself in a place at UCF where he doesn't have to worry about that. He doesn't have to worry about, you know, the meddling group of fortune 500 CEOs who are, who are breathing down his neck all the time, hoping that their kid can get a shot at, you know, backup long snapper or something. He just can be a coach. And I think that's what UCF offers him is that, I mean, he coached at high school for 10 years. He's, he's a coach's coach. And um, that's the, and that's the overwhelming feeling that I got from the folks that we talked to at all uh, with Auburn was he's going to, he's, he, he, he's kind of getting back to his roots in that perspective. Yeah. In terms of reaction from the Auburn side, for me personally, I talked with a couple of people at 24 seven sports who have covered Gus Malzahn very closely over the past few years. And, and since he's been at Auburn, they told me, and specifically one person told me that, from watching his press conference, he hadn't been that excited at a press conference since like 2017, uh, just in terms of like enthusiasm and energy. And, you know, coaches all the time say we're going to win championships and we're going to put a fence around for recruiting. And I mean, it's hard to mess up an intro press conference. Right. But for me being there and and being at uh, other press conferences for, you know, for Josh Heupel and then, and watching other press conferences for other coaches, um, it, it did feel genuine for Gus Mazan. It did feel genuine that he really wanted to be at UCF. Like Jeff mentioned, he said four or five years ago, if, if the right guy came in uh, and, and actually stayed there and built it, it could become a powerhouse. And, and he felt like he was the right guy for that. And obviously time will tell how that works out, but it just felt really genuine. And, and he wasn't just out there saying the right things, but he actually meant it. Yeah, I totally agree with what you guys are saying as far as where Gus Malzahn is in his career. Obviously, he's a guy, uh, like you were talking about, Jeff Sharon, uh, 15 years or so, went in the in the high school game, and then he moved on to the, the college ranks. Um, coordinator experience at Arkansas, obviously a very successful coordinator as well under Todd Graham at Tulsa, and then obviously the, everything that he did at Auburn, Arkansas State, et cetera. But um, tremendously proven coach, has won, what, close to 70% of his games in nine years as a head coach, uh, 77 and 38. Um, and, and what is contract, five years, 11 and a half million, is that correct? Yep. So um, if, if you guys would uh, um, elaborate a little bit more on, uh, on that contract, what can you tell me? Uh, where, where was Josh Heupel compared to Gus Malzahn, where he is 2.3 million per year? Jason, I think you had the best details on that, right? Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly what Josh's was. I think, I think it was in the same ballpark. Um, yeah, I think he capped out at about 2.2 million a year. Is that right? Somewhere around there, and then Josh is start, or, or uh, Gus is starting at like 2.3. Yeah, that 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 sounds right to me. I know that you know, I know that I think Josh got a little bit more money in his extension that he signed. You know, they always do those extensions after two years or whatever. Um, I think the biggest thing uh, for his staff, you know, you look at the, the staff that Gus is, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the staff that Gus has put together already, um, the amount of money he's been able to spend, things like that. Um, I think someone had it earlier on, on, you know, message board or social media, they put together the previous staff, how much they were making versus the current staff. Obviously the big one was Randy Shannon, who was now going, I mean, he was going to get paid a million dollars this season regardless. Um, but that was one thing that was, that was huge in terms of a group of five coordinator, not just Josh Heupel, but um, yeah, I think, I think Gus's contract, I mean, we all know he just got a huge buyout from Auburn that maybe I don't want to say Terry would have said to him, Hey, maybe we don't have to spend so much money on you because everyone knows <laughs> you just got 21, you got $20 million out of $40 million that's still owed to him. Um, so I, I, it's not like he obviously took a job for money or anything like that. So I didn't think the contract was a huge part for Gus. I mean, he obviously, you know, five year is pretty standard, I would say. Um, and, and the money, the money wasn't an issue, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. One of the surprising not- things um, uh, I was, I'm sorry, Trace, that there was no offset clause in his contract with Auburn. So he, he wasn't, that money that he got from UCF wasn't, coming off of his Auburn buyout, he was getting all that money from Auburn anyway. So that's, which is pretty unbelievable when you think about it. I'm sorry, Trace, go ahead. 
Well, it certainly helps that the University of Tennessee is paying UCF so much money to take Danny White <laughs> and Josh Heupel, <laughs> allowing us to, uh, to hire a Gus Malzahn. You know, I think our fan base uh, still has to develop some calluses when it comes to its fan experience. I go back to the early 90s and Gene McDowell and 1AA years, and it for many of the fans, there was no football apparently before 2017 and they can't seem to make up their mind exactly. <laughs> they want this hot up and coming assistant coach, uh, a, a Scott Frost, and they expect him to be Bobby Bowden and stay with the program for 40 years. Or in a Gus Malzahn, suddenly he's Charlie Strong and uh, he's gonna flame out uh, as Charlie did in uh, Tampa. Uh, but perhaps Gus Malzahn, who, like Terry Mahajer, comes in very seasoned and experienced, successful, proven winner, right? Let's go back to the hiring of George O'Leary, who stayed for quite a while, and while there were ups and downs, had a great level of success. There's no guarantee that Gus Malzahn stays for 12 to 15 years. Maybe it's two, three years and out. I accept that if along the way, knocks off Boise State in the opener, has them contending with Cincinnati in the American and in the you know New Year's Six Bowl contention. If that's what he achieves closer to 2017, 2018 success, even if it's for a short stay, I think I'm fine with that. Something else that jumped out to me um, was, was Gus's emphasis on, on playing good defense. Now, obviously, it's one thing. A lot of coaches say that. Of course, you want to play good defense. But um, I did not realize that Gus Malzahn's first year in, in coaching, or at least one of his first years in coaching, back in the high school ranks, he was actually a defensive coordinator, kind of like Bill Walsh back in the day. I know he spent time as a defensive coordinator at Cal before everybody thought of him as an offensive mind, um, and rightfully so. Um, so what were your guys' thoughts on that uh, and the emphasis he, he uh, drove home about how UCS going to commit to playing excellent defense? I think one thing that stands out to me, I'll jump in right first. Um, that was something, and I think I don't, one of the Jeffs said it earlier, talking about Josh Heupel really needed to be focused on maybe next season being head coach, right? I remember – the first time UCF played at Memphis, and that was the let's go bone here play with Tosh McGowan and, and, and they come back in the rain and the flying Hawaiian game with Mackenzie Milton, a comeback win. And I know that people always talk about second half Randy Shannon, and that was one of his most memorable performances as a defensive coordinator shut out Memphis or gave up very few points in the second half. I remember that one of the first questions we were in the press conference room soaking wet because it had been raining. We asked Josh, Josh, what did you think of the defense performance? And he flat out said, you, you'd have to ask Randy Shannon that question. For Gus Malzahn to come out and say, we're not only going to come up and, and score a lot of points and do it real fast, but we're going to play championship defense. I don't want to say Josh Heupel obviously didn't make defense. You know, it wasn't, a, it was, it was important, but it wasn't a priority. And, that, you know, obviously he's an offensive coordinator and, and Gus will be calling offensive plays as well. But it seems to me that defense is also just as important to him and it's a priority for him. And he understands the importance of that. And that's not to say Josh Heupel didn't understand that or didn't make those connections. Obviously had a really you, you want to talk about a coach who's been around the block, Randy Shannon, a well-known name who was able to recruit a lot of guys and, and at times had a strong defense. Um, that was I think a brush of a, 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 a breath of fresh air for UCF fans to hear that from Gus. And my guess is Gus Malzahn thinks that if his team scores 49, as UCF did against Memphis, that his defense is going to hold the opponent to 48 or less uh, <laughs> and not give up 50. So they don't have to be stellar. They don't have to be top 10, top 15. They just have to be better, right? They just have to be better. And his offense, he's confident that they'll score plenty of points. So they just have to be better. Okay. Yeah, I would, Go ahead. Yeah, I would, I would actually add to that, too, that, you know, yeah, that's music to everybody's ears that, you know, yeah, you got to have a better defense. And you look in, in today's football, a three possession lead evaporates quickly. So if you're, if you got a kind of offense that can score 
50 points in a, in a football game, you, you know, at least get your defense to, to hold them to half. Right. Yeah. I, and, and I think that the other thing too, is I thought that that was a pretty clear um, olive branch out to the defensive players as well, because uh, both Terry Mahajer and, and Gus Mills or Terry Mahajer had said that when he spoke to the players, when he was trying to figure out, you know, what they wanted in a coach, it's there was a pretty clear indication for him that uh, that the defensive players thought thought you know, no one had actually said this, but from what we could tell on the record, but you get the feeling that he th- that I, th- I think that they thought that they were kind of neglected on their side of the ball um, by the head coach, and uh, and that was clearly Gus saying, "Listen, we're a full unit here. We're not going to be offense v defense. Uh, we're not two teams fused together in the center." we're going to be one team here. And I think that was really important that the defensive players needed to hear from their new head coach. Did you guys have the same um, thought I did when, when uh, Gus was asked about Randy Shannon and he gave kind of the stock answer that, well, that's it for Randy. (laughs) It was very non-committal. Yeah. Very non-committal diplomatic, but non-committal. To your point, Jeff, my concern, one of my concerns about Jeff Levy's name being floated is that it seemed more likely to me that he might keep Randy Shannon and that walled off approach that the offense is on one side of the building and the defense on the other, because it always seemed to feel that way, right? How many times as Jason mentioned, coach Hypo would defer to coach Shannon and uh, he'd make two to three, five minute media appearances in a 12 month calendar year. So it's not (laughs) like we were getting a great deal of opportunity to, uh, to explore things with Coach Shannon. In Coach Shannon's defense, though, when the offense was on the field as quickly as it was and the defense was on the field as much as it was, I don't know how many times they could bend and not break. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it was impressive to see that. And I think, you know, Jeff mentioned maybe the defense felt a little neglected. Well, that's, that's kind of part of, you know, you, if someone's going to be on the field for a short amount of time, chances are someone else is going to be in the field for a long amount of time. And whether that's fair or not, that's part of the offense and that's part of what it became. And, um, you know, I think when Trace mentioned they have to be better and they don't have to be a top 15 defense. If you have a top 10 offense, they have to be top 40 defense, maybe top 50 defense. I mean, it doesn't have to be much, much better, right? I mean, you talk about that Memphis game this past season, 50 to 49, one stop, win the game, right? I mean, you really just need one, two, three stops, maybe a turnover here and there. And that's what we saw this past season. They were able to put a lot of, they were able to get away and, and make a lot of takeaways. But, you know, I think that was one thing with Josh Heupel. I don't want to say he took his foot off the pedal, but I think that war and I four game this past season was a great example. They were up multiple possessions and you look at the final score and you're like, how did, how did South Florida put up, I think it was 46 points or something like that with like a one win team. that didn't beat an FBS program that, that said a lot about uh, where UCF was at the end of the season, I think. Yeah. I dove into the, into some of the advanced numbers on the possession statistics and in 2019 UCF's defense under Randy Shannon was actually pretty good. That was his best defense and was one of the, and was the best UCF defense, believe it or not, statistically, since the 2014 season where UCF won a share of the um, American crown and uh, they had averaged giving up 1.45 points per possession allowed in 2019, which is really good. If you're, if you're below 1.5, that's an outstanding defense that you have in 2020, it was 2.26 points per possession allowed, which is, Poor, <laughs> I don't, it, it, in in more ways than one. Just to give you an idea of how poor, the 2015 team, which went 0 and 12, and was a bad 0 and 12, uh, gave up 2.60 points per possession. So not quite that bad, but it was it was a pretty rough day out there for the defense in 2020. Now there were a lot of factors that played into that, a lot of opt outs prior to the season a group of players being caught in an uh, off-field incident where they got suspended for the rest of the year. Um, But 
it was uh, it, it, there was clearly erosion on the defensive side of the ball in 2020. Jason, you, earlier you talked about the connections of Gus Malzahn. Uh, Trace, let's start taking a look at this staff. Um, a lot of pieces have been assembled already, and let's start on the defensive side of the ball since that's what we've been discussing. I mean, you take a look at uh, Travis Williams, where he'd been linebacker's coach at Miami, but prior to that he had been a co-defensive coordinator at Auburn at one time, and then also David Gibbs. You look at him, uh, he, he has – four different stops where he had been defensive coordinator and also nine years of experience in the NFL, which, which looks good to uh, recruits. Well, I'm very impressed that coach Malzahn has assembled his staff as quickly as he has. Of course he comes in late and you've got a program like coastal Carolina that's more than halfway through spring practice and no clear date when UCF will begin it. So uh, credit to him for the staff he has assembled and it'll be interesting to see what he does uh, from a recruiting standpoint now. You know, he's, he's missed early signing day, he's missed national signing day, so he's got some time to make those connections. But he's familiar, as are a lot of these coaches, with the state of Florida. Uh, and that'll make it easier for him. Now, whether he can deliver four and five-star recruits, and I know those letter and number grades just light up Jeff Sharon because he's so <laughs> enthralled with those. <laughs> those. I know he loves those, but whether he can connect to four and five-star, just continuing to upgrade talent. You know, I had to laugh back to Josh Heupel at his press conference, and it might be interesting, a discussion to compare the two, who, who won bigger uh, during their press conference. But uh, of all the things Josh Heupel said, he talked about putting uh, that fence around Tennessee. And I thought, well, he had five recruits from Florida, so he certainly didn't erect that fence anywhere along the Florida border. Now, uh, you know, so we'll see what uh, Coach Malzahn does. But I'm impressed with how quickly he's put his staff together, the pedigree of uh, the coaches. But that's not to be surprised, uh, surprising considering his years of experience and the success that he's had along the way. Taking a look on the, the offensive side of the ball, you have Tim Harris Jr., co-offensive coordinator, running backs coach, coming up from FIU. Uh, he had been uh, recently named named the co-OC, I guess, by um, Butch Davis down at FIU, and he was a play caller. And then also, you of course have um, GJ Kenny, who who has a Tulsa tie to Coach Malzahn. And uh, he he had been the offensive coordinator for Todd Graham out at Hawaii. So and so, what were you, what were uh, your thoughts, Jeff Sharon, on those offensive coordinator hires? I, I I think it's interesting that Gus Malzahn is going with co-coordinators on both sides of the ball, which kind of shows you how he wants to divide the labor. Uh, Tim Harris Jr. We were pretty excited about because of course there's um, you know, as we had mentioned on on our side on Black and Gold Banneret, the offense that Gus Malzahn runs at least based on the evidence that we have to this point is a more run oriented offense than the air raid attack that we saw under Josh Heupel and in that respect it's a lot more similar to what Scott Frost ran when he was at UCF as opposed to what Heupel ran um, I think that was kind of the surprise that that greeted everyone was that Frost really does like to run the ball and Gus Malzahn likes to run the ball I think Jason you had a good statistic I saw where uh, Auburn had a 1,000-yard rusher every year under Gus Malzahn. And, uh, and, and so Tim Harris comes in as also coaching the running backs. His, uh, his experience in coaching running backs uh, speaks for itself. But also in G.J. Kinney, a guy who's going to, who, at least from what we can tell, is going to be on the, is the, also the quarterback's coach, and it will be in charge of the passing game. Uh, a guy who's familiar with, the league, of course, like you said, he played at Tulsa uh, as a court, was very successful as a player there, has NFL coaching experience. He was an offensive assistant with the Philadelphia Eagles um, and a little bit of a Hawaii connection, too, with um, Dylan Gabriel, because, you know, last year he was the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach at Hawaii. Dylan Gabriel, of course, is from Hawaii. Um, and uh, it, it, but it, but GJ, I think, brings a really good uh, pedigree to the um, to, to the offensive staff as well. He was a grad assistant at SMU before, so he knows his way around. Um, I'm really interested in, 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 to see how, uh, how this setup all works because, um, I, again, one of the things that, that we know about Gus is, you know, with that larger pool 
of money that he can hire assistants for. Uh, he's not having to listen to outside people quite as much as he had to at Auburn with saying, hey, hire this guy, hire that guy. No, he can go get the guys that he wants. And so far to this point, he's assembled a formidable coaching staff of, uh, of, of uh, guys who, are, who have uh, a, a wide range of experience, not just at the college and pro level, but also some of them on the high school level too, which I think um, uh, runs hand in hand with his commitment to re- kindling the personal relationships that the players had with the coaching staff under Scott Frost. And he wants to replicate that, I think, under, uh, uh, under his tutelage. And Jay, yeah, that was one, that was one thing that jumped out to me, Jeff noted at the very end. I love the high school experience on this staff. I mean, Tim Harris, you know, there's only, there's only a handful of high schools that everyone knows about and Booker T Washington is one of those high schools. He was the head coach in 2014. Under he he served under his father, who's a Miami legend, uh, Tim Harris Sr. He was offensive coordinator when Booker T won a lot of state championships. Um, you know, you, you you look at this past staff. There weren't a whole lot of connections with Florida under Josh Heupel. Obviously, Randy Shannon was the name uh, that everyone knew about in South Florida. I think Tim Harris is just like that, right? I mean, you talk about a guy that comes from Booker T. Washington, obviously coach at FIU the past few seasons, but, you know, you, you look at Brian Blackman and even Gus himself and some of these other names on the staff, they, they were high school coaches and, and they have great ties to the state of Alabama and, and Florida and, and, and uh, you know, kind of all over. So I think from a relationship standpoint and from a recruiting standpoint, uh, there are some really nice additions. And I think it's a really good blend of, you know, you, you talk about Gus and uh, some of these other guys, a, a really good mix of, well-experienced coaches, but up-and-coming coaches like Travis Williams and Tim Harris and GJ. Uh, I think there's just a really good blend, whereas, um, you know, you, you talk about other options that UCF could have gone in the direction of maybe a much younger staff versus a much older staff. I think this this has a really good blend of, the, of those two things that stands out to me. Jason, you know, I, I want to kind of jump on that point there too, because a lot of what this – coaching staff brings is the strong recruiting and, and they do want to lock down the state of Florida. And I thought it was interesting. And I don't remember who told the story, but somebody was saying, you know, when uh, uh, Gus Malzahn was recruiting Chandler Cox from here in Apopka, uh, you know, somebody said, well, that's one more time that Gus has been here than Josh Heupel has. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that kind of speaks to a little bit of, uh, you know, not, uh, you know, not chasing down your homegrown. Yeah, absolutely. But what's think... uh, Gus's pipeline from Germany like? Does he have a, <laughs> fence, a wall, perhaps, around Germany? Huh? Well, uh, two recruits coming from Germany. I don't think the folks at Germany want to talk about walls anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that point right there, right? You look at this past season, and, or not this past season, but this, this past recruiting cycle in the Orlando area. He signed as many kids as he did from Hawaii and Germany. And that's, that's great, right? There can be really specific situations where you might have a relationship, but you got to recruit your area. I mean, you really do. You look at guys that came out of Sanford Seminole, Jimmy Horn and Timmy McLean, they might cause problems for UCF in a, in a couple of seasons at South Florida. Uh, I mean, he, Gus did a better job and maybe it's because he worked at Auburn. Who knows? We, that'll be one thing that we'll have to watch out for, but he did a really good job of coming in, into the Orlando area and getting guys uh, to come to Auburn. So I think for me, you know, covering recruiting daily, it's, it's going to be, I'll be curious to see if there's that reality check of, okay, Auburn's logo isn't on your polo anymore, Gus. You're already, you know, I know UCF is a different beast, but you're still at a group of five program. And, and, and the, it's, I think some of you guys will be so surprised at how many recruits won't even consider coming to UCF. I'm talking about won't even consider talking with some of these coaches. I'm I, including Scott Frost, including Josh Heupel. These previous staffs, I think, had a reality check, said, wow, this is, you know, it's, it's tough recruiting at a group of five school, wherever you are. So maybe a name like Gus Malzahn, where everyone knows him. I mentioned this before this, you know, if you, if you were to pull 100 people and ask for 10 college coaches, Gus Malzahn is probably on that list for a lot of these, for a lot of people and for a lot of, uh, you know, high school recruits. So 
I think it'll be interesting to see long term these next couple of recruiting cycles if there will be a gust effect at UCF. And playoff oh, expansion sorry. to eight would certainly help him on the recruiting trail. And, and, and he was asked of that in his opening press conference. You know, that's not a one or two year away scenario, but that would certainly help programs like UCF if they could make that case. Because why would those top name recruits not want to play for it all? Now, they may not play for it all at Purdue or uh, Kansas, but they know, right, that they can't play for it all going to UCF. Well, the hard part about that, though, Trace, is that, that that's something that's beyond Gus's control. And it's beyond the athletic department's control. I mean, that's strictly a, a president. In fact, it's not even within President Cartwright's control to some extent. But I think going back to it, what you had said, Jason, about, you know, what are the cells that that Gus can have at, uh, at a, you know, two local recruits? Well, look at what UCF was able to do when they got guys like Gabe Davis out of Seminole, when they got Adrian Killens out of uh, Daytona Beach uh, mainland. Um, th there is a grid. Uh, I mean, even if you want to go back even further than that, Brandon Marshall was at Lake Howe and look how he turned out. So there is a track record of success with UCF uh, and local kids now, but I, I think one of the other things that you mentioned though, is that, I mean, recruiting is a much more national game now than it was even 10 years ago. So it, it, there is a lot more competition here in the state of Florida. You look at, I think somebody passed around uh, a, an interactive graphic that I shared on Twitter one time that showed um, all the different schools over the past 20 years and where they, and, and it was a heat map uh, of the United States. And based, any school that you clicked on, there was, there was always a little bit of color on Florida, Texas, and California, in addition to whatever state that school was in. So recruiting is a much different ball game. Um, but again, Gus does give that air of legitimacy based on his experience. And we'll see how that pans out. I guess we'll have to wait for almost a year to see how it pans out <laughs> once he gets his first recruiting class in. Taking a look at the staff, um, six on-field assistants, some um, by my count, have been hired. Is that correct, Jason? And uh, tell us some, um, tell us what positions are, are, are lacking. And obviously, ten on-field assistants. And then, um, is anybody, whether it's administratively or on the field, uh, being retained? Um, that that may, maybe isn't isn't moving on. Yeah, I think the one name you're missing. We're up to seven now. Addison Williams. Uh, he was the safeties coach at Coastal Carolina. He worked under Gus before. Uh, he was the seventh assistant on field coach hired today. So uh, he has three spots left. I think the one that's most exciting and potentially is defensive line coach Then there's wide receivers coach. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how he uses that last spot, probably line, another linebackers coach, potentially outside linebackers uh, coach. But um, yeah, I think if there was one name that UCF fans probably wanted to keep, it was probably Corey Bell, at least for on field assistant coaches um, Corey definitely had those in-state connections and, and was able to get some recruits that like you talk about impactful freshman Corey Thornton was a true freshman that played every single game this season that hadn't that hadn't happened since Gabe Davis came in um, and I think Corey might have been kept around but unfortunately he wasn't and they added Addison Williams who's probably just as good as a coach um, you know from an off-field perspective um, I don't think anyone was kept I mean they they for whatever that, you know, they, some of the guys, um, you know, football operations, Billy Ray Johnson followed Josh Heupel, to Tennessee. Um, they, they added SJ Tui, who most people know from the movie Blindside as director of football operations. I think when that hire was announced, I said, Hey, why do I recognize that name? And okay. Now that I know he's in Blindside, is he good at his job? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think they've they've done a good job. I mean, you look at the strength and conditioning coach. They hired Chris Dawson, longtime Kansas State strength and conditioning coach, um, out of there. And and today they added a recruit recruiting uh, coordinator, recruit director of recruiting and player personnel who previously uh, worked under Gus uh, Devin Ducote. I might be pronouncing that name wrong, but um, you know, from an on and off field perspective, I think he's he's putting together a really nice staff that have. Uh, various connections. Yeah, he really has. Um, you know, looking at Addison Williams' bio, um, 
he had been a defensive coordinator at the Division II level at Tusculum in um, Greenville, Tennessee, and then also um, at Furman, which is, which is traditionally a very strong FCS program, a team that's vying for the playoffs. Yeah, I think I think Addison's a great addition. I think that was one name I mentioned last late last week as a potential name to watch out because of his connections with Gus. Obviously, we all know what Coastal Carolina was able to do this past season. Uh, I think there was a specific statistic. I don't remember the exact number. Uh, they had a high number of interceptions. I think it was like third nationally in pass defense or something like that. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's 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 coming together. There's a few spots left, three spots left uh, that. If I had to guess, you know, maybe it'll be wrapped up tomorrow. Um, at least definitely by Wednesday, if I had to guess, we'll probably talk with Gus later this week about about the staff and 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 you know what happens next. So um, but yeah, I think I think it's he's he's doing a good job so far with with the resources he's had. Really appreciate your time this <clears throat> this evening, guys. Um, but as we're closing this out, uh, we'll start with you, Trace. Any closing thoughts on on the hires and everything that's going on with UCF? And then go ahead and uh, plug your content with um, the Sons of UCF podcast. I'm just happy to see that momentum has shifted for UCF. Again, as I mentioned, between Mackenzie Milton uh, leaving for Florida State, uh, Bam Moore uh, going to Florida State, uh, the Boca Bowl loss, uh, the death of Gene McDowell, just several things that happened. And then, you know, Danny White and Josh Heupel leaving, and you're just wondering where the program is. In very quick order, it turned around, and there are high hopes for the success of Terry Mahajer, and you get in him an experienced athletic director, and in Gus Malzahn, you get an experienced coach who beat Alabama a couple of times in a pressure cooker to borrow one of our media colleagues terms uh, the uh, in Alabama and the SEC and the record that he had in the SEC you know is one of the top leagues if not the top league year in and year out so you know he can succeed and uh, I think that gives us uh, hope and optimism going into spring camp which will begin not too long from now as for content, I'm happy to be co-host of the Sons of UCF live show Thursdays, 8 to 9 o'clock Eastern, streaming live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And you can catch that uh, by uh, following at Sons of UCF on Twitter or any of the Sons of UCF uh, pages. Jason? Yeah, overall, uh, you know, we talked about the press conference a little bit and, and the staff that Gus Malzahn has brought together. Um you know, I think one more point on the press conference, obviously I think the virtual aspect of it helped, but I don't remember having that many national media around UCF or interested in UCF and uh, writing about UCF for a couple of years, obviously since the 2017 season. So I think there's just, just a lot of uh, really good buzz around the program right now. Trace mentioned the, you know, the momentum swinging in the right direction. Uh, it's, it's only, obviously February 20th, 22nd and February, early March. So uh, I think UCF fans want September to come around and, and to see how this unfolds on the season. So uh, I think there's a lot to look forward for uh, under Gus Malzahn at UCF. And you can uh, read my stuff and, and follow along as he continues to put together his coaching staff, nights247.com at the real BD on Twitter. Uh, so, so keep it locked in there. Jeff Allen. Well, you know, I kind of think about, you know, how time flies and how small a world it is. When you think back to 2016, UCF lost in the Cure Bowl to Arkansas State, and their AD is now our AD. And you think at the end of the Peach Bowl, the guy on the other sideline ends up being our head coach. So it is kind of strange how all this intertwines. And uh, interestingly enough, my neighbor is an Auburn fan who really loved me after the Peach Bowl. Uh, she had texted me after the Gus hire and said, you got my Gus. And, you know, that kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, the, the Auburn fans did have an affinity uh, and a love for uh, Gus Malzahn. Uh, as far as my content, you can catch me on the Nightline Sports Network. I host the AAC Report and I host my own podcast, Jeff Allen Sports Talk. And I just uh, uh, dropped one tonight uh, with uh, Ricky Cobb from at Super 70 Sports on Twitter, that great uh, Twitter feed. Jeff Sharon. Yeah, well, it's I, echoing what, what the guys have said. It's it, it was key for UCF to um, to to strike back after a long 
you know, a, a fall of some pretty rough news. And, uh, and right now, I mean, the, the new car smell is back, right? Uh, and I, I think that one of the interesting things though is, you know, we just had the schedule drop this week and this schedule does UCF no favors at all. Uh, so it's going to be a pretty tough schedule. If UCF can get through the schedule and be in contention for the American, once again, I think as a lot of fans do expect, it's going to be, um, it's going to be a heck of a lift, but, um, but th there are some opportunities to make some real national headlines, starting with that Boise state game, um, in the opener, they got a game at Louisville as well in the middle of September. Um, they're playing at Cincinnati. That's going to be a big game home for Memphis on a Friday night. Um, and then of course, uh, two straight games to finish at home, including black Friday against South Florida, um, at home as well before the uh, American championship. So, um, it's going to be a, uh, th there might be some growing pains with a new staff as there always seems to be. Um, but it's uh, it, it's a challenge that if anyone is up to it, it's Gus Malzahn and certainly the the staff that he's put together. Uh, so it'll be a, it'll be it's going to be a fun ride and a really intriguing spring and summer to say the least. Uh, as far as content, you can uh, follow a uh, Black and Gold Banneret at blackandgoldbanneret.com. We're on Twitter at UCF underscore Banneret and Facebook.com slash Black and Gold Banneret, and you can subscribe to our podcast, the Black and Gold Banneret podcast, uh, wherever. Uh, you get your podcasts uh, if you're on iOS or Android. And a quick little shout out to um, Danny Medina. I think you had credited her uh, earlier, uh, Bubba and Jason, about uh, a uh, uh, 10 things to know about Gus Malzahn. It was Danny who wrote that article. And thanks to her and thanks to all of our staff at Black and Gold Banneret for um, coming up with some amazing content and following UCF as closely as we do. Absolutely. Well, but do you mind a question? What's the reaction to the last couple of weeks at UCF in your neck of the woods? How are these hires being received by your fan base? <clears throat> Haven't discussed it a ton, to be honest, but with the folks that I have discussed it with, uh, it's kind of like what I was saying earlier when they made the hire, when you guys made the hire of Terry Mahajer, I, we really thought that um, Gus Malzahn would um, quite probably be the next head coach. And so we, we love the hire um, as far as the few Pirate fans that I have discussed it with. So, um, but really appreciate you guys coming on, spending so much time tonight. This is a lot of fun. And I really look forward to having you back on down the road, whether it's this program or on the sports objective. Trace, we still need to have you on the sports objective now that we've connected. Anytime. That concludes this edition of the Bubba Rose Show. We appreciate you tuning in. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you listen. Also, be sure to follow us on social media, at Bubba Rosenbaum on Twitter, at Bubba Rose Show on Instagram. Like and follow the Bubba Rose Show on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Let us hear from you by emailing us at Show at gmail.com. Again, that's Show at gmail.com. We'll see you next time, y'all.